Oh, good. So I, I, I have this piece of paper because I was like, are my notes on this? They are. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here, and I'm so glad, Peter, thank you so much for kind of um, setting, the frame, setting the framework for, um, uh, you know, an analysis of why we do what we do, because everything really has to come out of facts and out of a, a good analysis. So we're, I'm going to talk a little bit about today um, a few things. Um, this is a photograph of uh, some f young children who are in our program. And my goal is to really talk about this idea of what intergenerational learning is all about. Um, first of all, I want to just um, have one shout out to my colleague, Ann Byrne, who's right there sitting beside her wonderful husband who's accompanying her. And Ann is really the person, and I'm just going to tell a brief story about how I even got involved in this idea of Montessori. Um, I had uh, taken a position, um, and I'm not going to be very long. Um, I, had a, I, I took a position as a, um, basically as a, a project manager for a um, group of citizens who wanted to create an apartment building with certain amenities in the apartment building. That's about as specifically specific as I could describe it. And um, I come from a community organizing background, uh, so I was very, very interested in that. I had worked for an assistant secretary of housing and community development for the United States in the area of community development. And my interest was really in how to leverage housing um, and create social capital. Prior to being in that role, I had spent uh, close to 10 years on Skid Row in Washington, D.C. For those of you that don't know um, what Skid Row is, Skid Row is the place um, in a city that is completely abandoned and is the area where people live on the street. Um, the people that generally live on the street six blocks from the seat of power in Washington, D.C. Um, so you don't need to be very political to describe the inequities of that. Um, we're generally um, farm workers, um, men, uh, some women who were prostitutes had been victims of human trafficking. And my first assignment when I moved to Skid Row and lived there for 10 years was to kind of do a Montessori process. And that was to sit in a laundromat and listen to what people said they needed. And obviously, the first thing that people need was food. And an outgrowth of that was out of that enormous need for a meal on a day-to-day -day basis, we created a free food program that served close to 500 people a day, um, all based on voluntary donations. Um, the first person who gave out the bowl of soup at this soup kitchen, which was located in an abandoned uh, barber shop that we had converted into a community uh, center, um, was Mother Teresa of Calcutta. So I've been very blessed to have colleagues like this from all over the world who are engaged in this process. So this is kind of who I am, where I come from, and the framework that I come from. But after this experience, somebody said to me, and work in the housing development area, look at Kathleen, what you really need to do is you need to learn how to talk to bankers. You need to figure out how you get large resources to work for families and children. You've retrained yourself on what the needs of communities are. Now, how do you think about scaling this and how do you talk to bankers? And that's what I was intending to do with this focus on housing development. Anyway, that's a brief, that's brief. I could go on and on. Um, Next, the next point is, um, so we've been, at, we've been at this project for close to, honestly, 27 years. Um, what was supposed to be a very short job 
turned into a very long job. And um, we originally started with a building and some amenities. We thought people need childcare, they need this, they need work, they need this. We'll put this all together and put it in a mixing bowl and it will all work. Well, the fact of the matter is there wasn't one integrated system that we could train across multiple domains. And what, ha what came out of this was I, I engaged a um, brilliant consultant in the area of early childhood development, who's my colleague, Ann Byrne, who came as a volunteer. And after one year, she said, Kathleen, you're never gonna be happy with any kind of existing childcare curriculum. The only curriculum I know that's gonna meet the needs of both families and children is Montessori, because it's rooted in the natural world, it's rooted in biology. I had been trained in family systems theory, so this was just a, a, an extension of what I already knew. Um, so I, I wanted to just take a second and have you look about, take a look at um, what we see as the key factors for success in an intergenerational community. I'm not gonna bo bother you with any of that, but I, I, one of the things I really want you to look at is <clears throat> social capital building across generations, creating opportunities where we can create social capital. And the other piece is changing the narrative. That's exactly what Ann Kelly's talking about when she says going into institutions and totally changing the narrative, looking at what we call the social model of care. So these are some of the key, key factors that work in relationship to this. The key fr principles that we see are, um, another point that I wanna have you look at is a wisdom circle of elders. Make elders at the core of who you are and what you do. Listen to elders. Every school community whether you believe it or not, if you're focused on zero to six, you're focused on adolescence, you can evoke that wisdom circle of elders to participate. I thought I would put this model up because I wanted to give you a sense of what the complexity of this is when you start thinking about Montessori as an ecosystem, Montessori, using Montessori across multiple domains as a philosophy of care. As you can see, children, families, and elders are at the center. The intergenerational community is at the top. Early childhood is a piece of this, health and well-being, social capital, which includes peer, family networks, coaching, and cohort strategies, post-secondary, and employment pathways, which include training, certification, workforce partnerships, industry partnerships, and scaffolding. So when I'm using the word scaffolding, what I'm really referring to is, especially for families that are entry-level families, I'm talking about giving small certificates and small credentials that scaffold them towards a career path, rather than setting out this very ambitious, um, you know, never to be attained goal of post-secondary education. It's thinking about how those certificates align. So in the United States, and I know in Europe right now, there's a big conversation about micro-credentialing, and that's precisely what we're talking about. So this is the framework that we have in our heads, and this is across every domain when we're, when, when we're thinking about serving families in an intergenerational context. <clears throat> Obviously, the other thing that all families need in this is economic assets. So we don't talk about financial literacy, we talk about asset building, okay? They need housing, they need transportation, and then certainly the early childhood. Um, our model really tries to integrate Montessori across three learning areas. 
the Montessori School, which is located on our campus, the Family Leadership Academy, which gives people the skills where they can thrive, <clears throat> and the Intergenerational Learning Center that connects across differences in ages. Um, this is pretty much the model that we've used from the beginning, although we continually change and we continually improve this. In our school, our main goal is to inspire peaceful citizens. And we do this in a way that is very traditional. The teachers are guides, we have communities of purpose, and it's very mixed from a socioeconomic standpoint. The Family Leadership Academy is workforce housing. It's an apartment building with 50 units of housing right on a campus that is a 64,000 square foot building with on five acres um, located right outside the nation's capital. We see everything we do through the lens of what we call a two-generation approach. <clears throat> we provide safe, secure homes, certainly the training opportunities that I was describing before, workforce housing, so we even house on our campus our assistant teachers. We have five assistant teachers that live right on our campus because, as you all know, there isn't enough money to be able to provide the kind of economic security for our teachers. So these are some additional subsidies that we provide, which include the housing. <clears throat> the focus of what we teach is really social entrepreneurship. We can align the social entrepreneurship cross ages with the Montessori sets of, of, of principles. So I was describing for how we align these principles. That's a really important thing. All of this can be aligned in that context. And then our intergenerational learning center. Um, we see seniors as assets. We see seniors mobilizing social capital. We engage them in service. We engage them in professional development. And we have a prepared environment for adult learning. The prepared environment for the adults are is what we call a maker studio. It's a maker space that's located right in our school. It is not separate. So those of you that are familiar, all of you with Montessori curricula, can understand that we don't have add-ons, do we? We have that embedded right in our community. It's a place where people can make materials um, and are available. The, ch the teachers, the children choose to come into the environment. It's not we're going to bring the children in to sing a song for the people. Is, does that, are you with me? Right. It's embedded right into the environment, into the environment. So our, our goal is, this is the takeaway, we're building a modern village for each child, elder, and family. This is how we see a modern village. <clears throat> of course, I need my glasses to get this one. Um, and the qualities of our village. When you walk through the door, you know you're coming home. It's a community that has a commitment to continuous learning. I like this quote from Maria Montessori. Um, Imagination does not become great until human beings, given the courage and strength, use it to create. Um, so the, the real takeaway for the, from this is how do we have this courageous curiosity? That's what has to fuel us. It's not a curiosity that's, um, that's insular. It's really a courage, courageous curiosity to think about Montessori philosophy across multiple domains. How do we leverage the capital of every school? 
how do we leverage the intellectual capital of every school to really make this kind of change and be this beacon from a community context of intergenerational values and hope, which I believe Maria Montessori um, talks so significantly about. The spirit of, of discovery is something that's really, really critical for us. We just heard about this from the professor at Leiden University, but the impulse for curiosity with small children is so, so, so strong. Um, and during this period, um, just to think about this, there are 100 billion neurons expand to 25,000 connections in the brain. So those are the kinds of things that are happening on a minute to minute basis in this learning community. When we start thinking about it from that perspective, it really changes the kind of reverence that we use with everyone that we encounter. Um, because of that, professional development and staff development is really, really a number one priority. Um, we, we see each staff member, whether they're the person that's uh, mopping the floor or the person that's educating the child in the classroom or the volunteer coordinator in the maker studio as a part of this integrated ecological setting. Um, we foster the courage to be curious and to be creative. We do that in workforce development. So our kitchen, as an example, does not just function as a kitchen that provides food for our children or for our meetings. Our kitchen is a project-based activity for workforce. So we leverage everything for workforce. This is our chef, um, who is our culinary arts instructor, and these are two of our team members. The one team member on the left is a woman who is a recent um, immigrant from Kathmandu, and the other woman, Nilda, is a woman that walked from Peru to the Mexican border and made her way to Washington, D.C. Both of these women live on our campus with their children and with their families. So they've been fortunate to be able to find this space. They both have been given certificates, mini certificates, that are requirements of the complex regulatory environment that we find ourselves in. So they have a food handler's certificate. And one of the women, the woman on the left, Nilda, is a woman who um, was a nurse, a professional nurse in Kathmandu. Our goal for her would be to um, give her the skills so she eventually can work in our zero to three program. This is where the training, the A to I training, any of the assistant training has to have the flexibility for us to be able to accommodate the needs of some of these um, workers. The other woman, this is our Nido, just to have you a, have a sense of this. And I want the most important thing in this photograph is these two little babies right down here. Does everyone see them? So those are my twin grandsons, <laughs> Thomas and Patrick. So I'm so fortunate to be able to be in this living learning community, have my grandchildren right in there. Because the common denominator for all of this is quality. It's quality. This is also a young woman who um, has had a lot of adversity in her life and she's attended our um, Family Leadership Academy and has participated in the Montessori A to I assistant training and has that skill. Um, so just want to kind of give you a sense of that. What are the benefits to children, families, and elders? It's certainly peace, 
quiet and simplicity. Um, and we've been seeing this over 27 years. So we, we see how this occurs and the deep, deep relationships over time. <clears throat> Current research on brain development supports this notion of courageous curiosity across the lifespan. And many of the things that, we just dis that you've just heard describe what this is. I wanted to give you a, some little capsules of who these people are that are in our community. But I, I want to point to the, um, the elders and sort of our wisdom circle, the leader of our wisdom circle of elders who are over in this corner. This young man, this, he's not a young man, <laughs> this man right here um, <clears throat> is, has developmental disabilities. Um, he said to me the other day, Kathleen, um, when I was 12 years old, um, I took a baseball bat and I broke windows in every car in a town called Hyattsville, Maryland. And he said, the police came and they locked me up. Really what happened was he was sent to a training center for uh, uh, young people who have developmental disabilities. And he lived there until he was 21 years old. He then came out and he went to work for um, a, maintenance, a maintenance crew uh, for the st state of uh, Maryland. But the interesting thing about him is um, he found himself in a situation where he was uh, <clears throat> operating with a very, very low amount of social security and he had been evicted. Um, he moved into our community and coincidentally, he was the maintenance man for the park that surrounds our building. So he's on campus. He wakes up every morning at four o'clock in the morning and he patrols the property and he picks up trash. So he has a very active function on our property. We have a meal at noontime, which the, children's, uh, with the, which the children um, obviously are given, but at the same time, all of us share together. So we break bread with him every noon. Uh, the woman next to him is a, is a woman who was a, uh, a nanny in, for a wealthy family in Washington, D.C. Um, nannies don't have any security. <laughs> uh, nannies are, um, you know, the ash can, uh, they're, they're sent away. I think the family that she worked for after she gave 25 years of her life to this family, they told her that they would give her $2,000. So this isn't an unusual situation. We know all of these people. Um, they're with us every day, cross class and culture. So she lives on our campus and enhances us in a very wonderful way because one of her beautiful skills is she's a seamstress. So she spends time making the materials for our classroom. We have a system that we call time dollars. So it's not a volunteer system it's really a validation of people's work. And what we do is we discount the rent based on how many hours people put in. So it's a very real, tangible thing that promotes self-efficacy. Um, I have this as another picture of another one of my grandchildren <laughs> who attends our school. But that's back on the issue of quality. Um, and really believing in the value of being in environments where people are together cross class and culture. And these are things why, just barriers of why it's not easy to do this. It's a simple thing, but it's not easy to do it. And these are some of the barriers that we see. Um, so what inspires us? Um, Two things I just want to talk about, certainly being able to laugh, fill your life with joy, but um, not focusing on the assets, not focusing on the deficits, but having a mentality of being collaboration ready. 
that is not something that um, one um, can say we're in, interested in being in collaboration. It really is believing that collabor that you are organizationally collaboration ready. And then this next piece, courageously curious. Um, it matters how we frame these issues. Um, we try to frame the issues, Peter was talking about this, outside of the traditional categories of early education, of education, housing, medicine, and community development. Okay, we try to frame it outside of that. That's important. And then it has to be seen as long-term and multi-generational. So I want you to think about the assets in your school communities and how you can shift these perceptions by using those assets. I, I put this um, up by Ophelia. Some of you may or may not be familiar with the work of E.O. Wilson, um, but I think he's somebody that we should really look at as a model. E.O. Wilson is an evolutionary biologist and he's written many, many books, but his framework of, of biophilia, I think, is something that we need to really understand. It's really this deep human tendency to connect with nature and all forms of life. When we remove that, as all of you, many of you know very, very deeply, we, we uh, experience violence. And the question to all of you is, what will your village look like? I'm gonna show you the dream of what I'd like our village to look like. It would be a village that incorporated families, children, elders, our school, health and wellness center, the training center, and um, a center for gathering. The word that we call it is Nushima. So, and what is Nushima? Nushima is a word from the uh, original people that lived in Washington, D.C., the original people. And what it means is mother tree. So I'd love to have you stay connected with me. And I want to leave you with this one one piece of joy and this one um, quote from Tagore. I slept and I dreamt that life was joy. I awoke and I saw that life was service. I acted and behold, service was joy. Thank you.